Um, all right, so we're going to start a new module today. Uh, we're going to start two lectures on a new type of generative models. Let's talk about GANs. Before we do this, as usual, let me do a little recap here. Um, remember that we've been working for the last few weeks with the following setup. We have some data set, in this case, images uh, that we collected from some distribution, some data distribution for a specific task. In this case, we have images of animals and we would like to build a generative model over these images. And what this means is that we want to define a probability distribution, uh, PF theta, that will live within some set of possible distributions. Uh, and our task is going to be to find some model that approximates well our data distribution in terms of some kind of distance or notion of similarity between distributions, which we call D. And most of the work that we have done so far in the class has looked at different types of model families. So different ways of representing this distribution P theta. We started with our aggressive models, which as you remember, are based on the chain rule of probability. They start with this formula and then they parameterize each conditional term here, each conditional product in this, each conditional factor in this product. Another approach that we have seen after uh, our regressive models were late variable models, and in particular, variational autoencoders. And these models have extra variables, extra latent variables, Z, which are useful for unsupervised representation learning. And that was our main motivation for studying variational autoencoders. But if you remember, having these latent variables makes things much more complicated because now the correct formula for the probability of the data under the model is this complicated integral, or it can be complicated. It is complicated in many cases. Uh, and we can't do this integral exactly, so we had to find all this machinery of variational inference to be able to optimize these kinds of models. Uh, so that was really complicated. And as an attempt to simplify things and in an attempt to make things more tractable, we looked last week at normalizing flow models. And the idea of a normalizing flow is to have this bijective, bijective mapping F between the latent space and the observed variables. And if this F is in some tractable space, we can have the follow, we can use the following formula to compute exactly the probability of any data point. So instead of having to do this integral and then approximate it, there is an exact formula. So that's nice, but the, uh, the, the catch here is that it also, this formula involves this extra term, which is the determinant of the Jacobian of F. And a determinant is, uh, it's, a, it's an object that is in many cases, computationally expensive to compute. In general, when we have, um, so this, determ this Jacobian is an N by N matrix in general, it takes n cube time to compute the determinant of an n by n matrix. Uh, that's too slow for applications of generative modeling where we need to repeatedly compute this gradient, uh, this determinant to compute the gradient. Therefore, we had to restrict our attentions to certain types of Fs. So when we use this model in practice, this F here is not any function. We looked at very specific types of functions for which the determinant of the Jacobian is tractable. We started with a few examples of simple combinations uh, of simple transfer, a few combinations of simple transformations, uh, such as planar flows. And, uh, and then we looked at a more general way of building these invertible transformations via models that have a particular type of autoregressive structure. Uh, so it can, in general, any other regressive model 
over continuous variables can be cast as a normalizing flow model. Uh, and it's also possible to add block structure into that recursivity. And this gives us other types of models such as real MVP or Glow it's a, is a more modern version of that. Um, but the, the, the main thing I'm trying to say here is that even though we no longer needed to use the variational inference, we still had to do a lot of work to get normalizing flow models to, 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 to obtain tractable normalizing flow models. Uh, uh, it, and, and the main task was to make this determinant tractable. So normalizing flows were still a lot of work, is, is what I'm saying. Um, and I guess the reason why these, I guess the, especially these last two model families were a lot of work is that in every case, we, we were trying to, uh, we were trying to approximate this term P of X or its, or its log, so log P of X. All of this work that we did was in order to compute the log likelihood of the data under the model. And we were, we wanted to do this because the log likelihood is our training objective. That's why we're spending so much effort in trying to find ways of computing it efficiently with all of these model families. But what if we didn't use the log likelihood? What if we used a different objective for which we would never need to compute this P of X and therefore we wouldn't need to do all of this work uh, using variational inference or using change of variables or trying to come up with families of transformations that have tractable uh, determinants of Jacobians. What if we could just not use log likelihood to begin with and then we wouldn't have to deal with all of these complications. So that's, that's what we're gonna try to do in this lecture and in the next lecture we're going to try to find a new way of training generative models that is based not on maximizing the likelihood, but instead on, on using a different objective that is based on samples drawn from the model distribution and the data distribution. So this objective will replace the likelihood. We're gonna look at other types of, um, other types of objectives and uh, in particular, we're going to, so yeah, we're gonna look at two types of objectives that replace the likelihood. One of them are going to be what I'm gonna call sample-based objectives. And then from there, in the next lecture, we will generalize to, to different types of divergencies between distributions. We will show that the sampling-based objectives that we will study in this lecture correspond to choosing a different training objective, a different type of divergence, not the real divergence, but another type of divergence. And then in the next lecture, we're going to study different types of divergences and how they can affect model training. And in the process of doing all of this, we're going to derive an important new generative model type, which is called the GAN, or which stands for Generative Adversarial Network. Okay, so that's the recap so far and the plan for what we wanna do next. Um, and so again, as I said earlier, we're going to first, so in this lecture, in the second, oh, sorry, in the second part of the lecture, I'm going to define GANs or generative adversarial networks. But before I do this, I would like to start with some high level discussion and motivation uh, about different training objectives that are not the log likelihood and that might have important advantages over the log likelihood. Okay, so let's first look at, uh, let's, let's, let's remind ourselves of some interesting properties of the likelihood objective. If you remember, in one of the early lectures, we derived the log likelihood as being equivalent to minimizing the KL divergence between the data distribution and the model distribution. So when we optimize the KL divergence, we are precisely trying to recover the data distribution. And we explain why that's the case. There's some algebra 
that we need to do to rewrite the KL divergence in a different form uh, that looks almost like our sample based log likelihood. Uh, and then we apply Monte Carlo, uh, we apply a, a Monte Carlo approximation to that and we get precisely our training log likelihood. And we show that this is an approximation to the KL divergence between the data distribution and the, and the model distribution. And if we could optimize over any possible distribution, if our model family was infinite and contained any probability, then we, then, you know, we would eventually get an updater, recover the true data distribution, and we would be done. We would have the optimal model. It would have the optimal best log likelihood and the optimal sample quality. We would literally have the best possible model because that is, that would be the data distribution. The data distribution is the global optimum of our optimization objective. So in theory, this should make sense. Um, but in practice, we don't have a perfect distribution. We don't have, we're not optimizing over the set of all the possible distributions. So we have to choose a model family that will never be, it, it will rarely, it will almost never contain the true distribution, the true data distribution. So we're gonna be uh, approximating the, the data distribution. And we also have a finite amount of data so we will never recover the optimal model. We're only going to be trying to approach the data distribution from some angle of the model space. Uh, and when we're not able to optimize our objective perfectly, different objectives lead to different trade-offs in terms of what solution we will get. So different objectives lead to different types of approximations to the true data distribution. If, if we have the right uh, model family and under that uh, hypothesis that we had of the model family, we do manage to get a KL divergence, that divergence that's zero, we've solved the problem. But, but, you, but you said generally we won't be able to get that uh, zero KL divergence and potentially the model family, even we, the best we can do under that model family, just because of the expressiveness of the model family, we won't be able to, uh, yeah, to, yeah. to even get there, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Okay, yeah. okay, so okay. in practice, we won't be able to get the perfect solution because you know, the distributions that we're trying to model, those are the distribution over, I don't know, all the possible images or over all of the text that's found on the internet. Those are really complicated distributions. It's unlikely that our, our regressive model will perfectly approximate the distribution of all the possible images that are out there, for example. So there's often gonna be some approximations that will need to be done. And when we cannot perform general modeling optimally, different objectives will lead to different trade-offs. Let me give you an example. Uh, so here in this example, I have a data distribution which consists of a mixture of two components. It's almost a mixture of two Gaussians. So it's not quite a Gaussian, but you can think of it as a mixture of two Gaussians. So we have one component here. Again, this is our, this is our data distribution. So we have these two components. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It's a little bit dark on the, I'll just try to color it like this. Uh, so we have these two components in the data distribution our data distribution is bimodal. And we're gonna to try to approximate this, uh, this distribution using a unimodal Gaussian. So our model is not able to capture the true data distribution because the true distribution is multimodal, it's bimodal, ours is unimodal, it's just a single Gaussian. If we use the KL divergence, well, what's going to happen is that we will find something which looks like this. Um, it, will, it, will, it will look like this. It will look like a single big wide Gaussian that tries to cover both components of the data distribution. I will come back later uh, and explain in a bit more detail why that's the case. But in practice, you know, we have to, have, we have to make a trade-off. So we could either try to cover both modes. We could either try to cover both components of the bimodal distribution or if we were to use other objectives, uh, I'll, I'll come back and define these a little bit later, but 
there's one objective that's sometimes used that's called uh, MMD, maximum mean discrepancy, or JSD stands for Jensen-Shannon divergence. We're gonna derive this later in this lecture. When we, when we use these other distributions, we have a different solution. So here, when we use the Jensen-Shannon distribution, we fit this component of the Gaussian very well, and we don't fit this one at all. So that's a different trade-off. Right? You could either try to model everything, but it's not perfect, or we could ignore one component of the data distribution and just fit one component well. Um, so as you can see, when we don't have a, the perfect model, we have to make different trade-offs and different objectives lead to different trade-offs. So it makes sense to think about whether the KL divergence is the right objective to use for the tasks that we're solving. Ultimately, when we're doing general modeling, we're often not interested in the log likelihood in itself. We're interested in the log likelihood as a proxy for something like good sample quality or good unsupervised representations. But log likelihood is not always, in fact, it's often not something that correlates perfectly with image quality. Let me give you an example of, of, of what I mean by this. So here, this is going to be uh, an example which will have good values for the log likelihood, but poor sample quality. How do we construct this example? Consider a model speed data that is a mixture of two components. It has 1%, uh, so 1 of the samples from the model are going to come from the data distribution, and 99% of the samples are going to come from a noise distribution. So most of the data generated from this model will be random noise, okay? Um, so we can try to get an estimate of what will be the log likelihood of this model. I can take the log of the, of the model distribution. Here I just write out the definition. Um, so this term is going to be uh, uh, is going to be positive, so I can lower bound the log likelihood by getting rid by getting rid of it, and then just applying the property of the log. I have this relationship, so the log probability of the model is bounded by the log probability of the data minus this constant term, the log of one hundred. Okay, this is just a little bit of algebra, and it gives us a lower bound. And obviously, because uh, we have the data, because the data distribution has the optimal log likelihood, we know that uh, we also have to have this upper bound. Okay, the data will, the data distribution will have the optimal log likelihood just because, just by definition of the KL divergence and by definition of the log likelihood, we know that this upper bound holds. So we can take our model distribution, and we have an upper bound and a lower bound, which are within a constant of each other, within an additive constant of each other. And what you can show here is that when this x here uh, increases in dimension, the relative magnitude of this constant term relative to, uh, to this term will start to become smaller and smaller. And so percentage-wise, the difference between this model distribution or the, the, you know, the, yeah, as a percentage-wise, this log, this model log likelihood will start to look similar to the, uh, to the, will start to look similar to the data distribution in higher dimensions. And so this is an example of how, in certain cases, we can get log likelihoods which are not that much worse than the data distribution, but rec recall that this distribution is 99% noise. So the, the samples won't look good. And so this is an artificial example where sample quality and log likelihood could be relatively uncorrelated. Similarly, we could construct an example where we have great samples, but really bad log likelihood. Um, the simple construction 
that achieves this is simply a model that memorizes the training set. Okay, so if we memorize the training set, then our samples look great. They look exactly like the training set. Um, so if we look at our training set loss, it's perfect in terms of sample quality, but the test set has zero probability because uh, we're assigning all the probability mass of the model on the training set, and that's the only thing it can generate, so it will never generate a test set example. Therefore, the probability of the test set is zero, and here we have really bad log likelihood, but great visual looking samples. And so what this means is that if we're interested in other tasks, if we're interested in sample quality, for example, we might want to consider different objectives. In fact, if we're interested specifically in sample quality, maybe we should look at objectives which measure sample quality directly in some way. And that's what we're gonna try to do using GANs. And more generally, the idea of using objectives which are not the likelihood, this is called likelihood free learning. Um, so we never have to, we will never, we will never measure the log likelihood as part of our objectives that are, that are, that are derived here. Um, so there are objectives, even if you were to switch from the KL divergence to something like some other divergence, it might require you to still evaluate the log likelihood. Um, here, we're gonna use objectives that are different from the log likelihood, and in particular, they will not require computing P of X anywhere, anywhere in the formula. And so that will have two advantages. One advantage is that we might be able to optimize directly for what we're interested in, which could be sample quality, and also we will not have to deal with this complicated task of evaluating likelihoods in the first place, which we know is computationally challenging and we have to come up with a lot of sophisticated math. We're gonna, we're gonna sidestep this by never evaluating what like. And so the class of generative models that are based on this idea, they're called likelihood free. Likelihood free is a very useful term to, to uh, remember. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's an image, here's a picture that shows what we're interested in. Let's say that we have some samples coming from one distribution, which we're gonna call P, and then samples from another distribution, which we're gonna call P2. We would like to compare these samples directly. So previously, we would compare these samples by evaluating the probability of one set of samples under the distribution under the model distribution. So let's say if P was our data distribution, we would measure the probability of P under Q, where Q would be our model. So that's the approach that we use in log likelihood. Here, we would like to have a different approach that compares samples from S1 and samples from S2 in terms of their image quality directly without using the likelihood, without ever computing the likelihood. And the specific question that we would like to answer that will help us train a generative model, the specific question we would like to answer is, given these samples, so samples coming from S, samples coming from Q, are they the same distribution? If we can answer this question, then we have something which might look like a training objective, because then we could optimize this notion of similarity between distributions use the based on samples, we could try to optimize it directly and make the two distributions similar, right? So if you remember, the KL divergence was a notion of closeness between distributions, but that notion of closeness involves computing the log likelihood. Here, the question I'm asking is, can we get a notion of closeness between distributions that is based purely on samples that evaluates them in a way that correlates with image quality and that does not involve ever the use of the log likelihood. That's the question that I'm gonna try to answer next. Um, so the solution to this task is something that's studied a lot in statistics, and it's called a two-sample test. So a two-sample test is literally the, or the, the set of two-sample tests is a set of techniques 
for literally answering the question that I just had in my earlier slide. Um, it's a way of reformulating that earlier question in the language of hypothesis testing. What I mean by this is that we start with a null hypothesis that the two distributions are the same. And what a two sample test in statistics does is to uh, either accept or reject this hypothesis H0. Um, sorry, uh, is to uh, reject the, yeah, is to either accept or reject the null hypothesis with some probability. Okay. There is uh, an uh, alternate hypothesis that they're not. Again, this is similar to the kinds of statistical tests involving p values that you would have seen before, except here the question that we're trying to answer is are the distributions the same or not? So our null hypothesis is that they're the same. The alternative is that they're not. And then the question is can we, do we accept or do we reject the null hypothesis? Um, with some level of confidence. That is the mathematical question that a two sample test tries to address. And the way it does this, the way a two sample test works is that it defines some kind of test statistic that compares these two samples. And if this test statistic is high, if it believes that the difference between the two distributions, between the two sets of samples is large, then it, then it rejects the null hypothesis. And if the test statistic is, mm, if, it's, if, it's look, if it looks within an acceptable range, then we do not reject the null hypothesis, okay? And an example of what a test statistic can look like, I will give you more examples, but just for now think of it as being, you know, the difference in means. You know, you take the average of samples in S1, you take an average of the samples in S2. If the averages are different, well, probably it's not the same distribution. So we can reject the null hypothesis. But if they're the same, well, we, well, I guess we can't necessarily reject the null hypothesis. It could still be that it's wrong, but we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? So, yeah, typically the way a two sample test works is that when T is uh, less than a certain threshold, we accept a null hypothesis and otherwise we reject this. And so this framework is going to be useful for us because it's an example of a likelihood free approach to comparing two distributions and determining whether they're the same or not. Okay. And, and so we could apply this framework to our task, which is generative modeling. Recall that here our goal is to have some notion of closeness. So we could, we, instead of using the decal divergence slash the log likelihood for, for, for D in this picture, we could instead use a two sample test, right? So what it means is that we can assume that we have access to a set of samples from S1. So our first set of samples will be our data set, right? Which is this set of samples from the data distribution. That's gonna be our first sample. And then let's assume we choose a model P theta from which we can sample. Okay, let's say that it's easy to draw samples from the model. And that's the case for many distributions that we have seen. For example, in a variational autoencoder, it's easy to draw samples. In a normalizing flow, it's easy to draw samples. Mm. With other aggressive models, that's more challenging. Remember, in other aggressive models, Sampling is slow because it's sequential and aggressive. So maybe a, an aggressive model might not be the best fit for this framework. But let's say we use any other model from which we can draw samples. So that gives us another set of samples called S2. And now we can apply the idea of two sample testing. Let's say we have some sort of two sample test. I'm gonna define some specific two sample tests in a moment. But let's say we have any two sample tests. Then it naturally gives us a, um, an, an objective, right? So we could train a generative model to minimize this two sample test objective between this set of samples and this set of samples. And this approach gives us a different way of constructing a notion of similarity between distributions. It gives us 
different optimization objective for for uh, for, for for our generative models. Right. So here I have presented to you a different strategy for defining a training objective for generative models. It is one that is based not on the KL divergence and the log likelihood, but rather on a likelihood free two sample test that I am yet to define. But the key idea here is that there is an alternative strategy to training generative models, which involves optimizing the statistic, the tests, the, the, yeah, the statistics of a two sample test. So what might be some two sample tests that we could use? It's actually a, a question that's not obvious at all. It's actually quite hard to find a good two sample test statistic in general. So here I have some example, here I have a few examples. So on the, on the left, what you see is uh, two distributions, one of, so there, there, there are two Gaussians. So here it's really easy to tell them apart because they have different means. But what if I were to push them so that they overlap and they have precisely the same mean? Well, then I have something like this. I have these two distributions. Now they have the same mean. They look the same according to my, according to a statistic that compares the means, but now they have a different variance. So that's not great. Um, now I could maybe update my statistic. I could update my two sample test to compare both the mean and the variance. But if I do that, I can again come up with another example where the distributions are not the same, or where they're, yeah, where they're not the same, but they have the same mean and variance. Oops. So here I have, um, here I have the, I have two distributions. One of them is Gaussian, the other one is Laplace. They have the same mean, the same variance, but they clearly look different. One of them is, is, is like a bell. The other one is like a triangle of some sort with a sharp peak. They, they don't look the same anymore. So for any test that I can come up with, I can then try to cheat and come up with a different distribution that, uh, that, that's, that's not the same as the one to which I'm comparing, but the one that looks the same on this picture. So it's always possible to come up with, given a test, I can find ways of cheating and coming up with a distribution that fools the test, right? And so, and so that's a problem, but in our case, we have an interesting way of getting around this problem. Uh, notice that in our formulation of the problem, we're not just comparing any samples, we're comparing samples that come from the data distribution and samples that come from the model distribution. So we know that the two distributions are different to begin with, right? We know that one set of samples come from the model, the other one comes from the data distribution. Because we know the true answer to whether they're the same or not, we can use this knowledge to learn the test statistic from data, right? We can use the fact that we know that some samples are real and some samples are fake to learn a statistic that will try to discriminate them as much as possible, okay? So the key idea here is that we're gonna to try to learn the statistic that maximizes some notion of distance. We know that these samples are real, these samples are fake. Can I use machine learning to learn a classifier that will maximally separate the two different classes. Once I have learned the statistic, now I can, I, can, I can fix it, and then I can try to perform generative modeling to make my model distribution and my data distribution similar according to my new test statistic. Once I try to minimize them, it's possible that the generative model will try to cheat, and it will, it will generate samples that fool my statistic, it, it makes things the same according to my statistic, but the distributions don't really look the same. So then I can fix again my generative model, I can update my test statistic to try to, again, discriminate the model and the, discriminate between the model and the data distribution, learn that, then again, re-optimize the generative model, 
reoptimize the test statistic, and I can keep doing this until I have something, until I'm in a situation where no matter what kind of statistic I learn, the samples look indistinguishable, and therefore I must have samples which actually look like the data distribution. Does this strategy make sense? So if you're familiar with GANs, you see where I'm going, I think. Uh, so this procedure of learning a two sample test and then using it as a training objective for a generative model, that is precisely what a GAN does. Here I have, I told you, I told you a story for where the GANs come from. This is what a GAN does and interpret it as optimizing this two sample statistic. Um, so if you haven't seen GANs before, well, I'm gonna show you next how we can use this machinery of two sample tests to define a specific general model. The idea of learning the test means that we're gonna generate samples and we know that these samples should have a different test statistic from the real samples. So therefore we're gonna use them to train them. We're gonna have two classes essentially, the real and the fake data. And we're gonna use these samples to learn a model that will distinguish the real from the fake, just as a test statistic in a two sample test distinguishes from real and fake. But yes, when we do, when we, when we do all of the work that we're doing here, we never actually define a formula for what P of X is like we did it with other regressive models, for example. So with other regressive models, P of X equals the product of these terms. For each term, I have a formula that's a function of some set of parameters. Here, I never define what, I, I never define a formula for, for what P of X is, um, but I still have a distribution because it's defined via samples, right? If I were to draw samples from my model, they, they, they're spread out over the space of all the possible images in some way, so it still defines some distribution, except this distribution is not defined explicitly via a formula, it's defined implicitly via samples. And so this is why we also call these types of models, and by that I mean GANs and their extensions, we refer to these models as implicit models. And I have a slide on that shortly. Okay, so what are GANs? Again, is going to be a new type of general model whose model family is, the, is defined by, well, I guess it's, we, so we, we start by defining the model family here and the specific model, the specific parameterization that, I guess the, the we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna refer to the GAN model as the, the core of the GAN model will be the generator, okay? So the generator is going to be any sampling process that goes from a latent set of variables Z to a set of observed variables X. And the mapping from Z to X is going to be defined by some function G with parameters theta, okay? Um, so this defines a mapping between Z and X. Now this model G, it can be any parametric process from which we can sample. Um, and now this, uh, this is basically saying what, what, what this is answering, this is kind of addressing the question you just asked. So notice that this, so this G here will be any process that can take samples from X. Um, so it outputs, before all of our parametrizations would output the parameters of a distribution over X, right? That's what a VE does. The output of the neural network that parameterizes a VE is a mean and a variance over the data distribution or over whatever distribution it's modeling. Here, we're outputting not the parameters of the model, but we're outputting samples from the model directly. And because we never output the parameters of the model, we can never write out exactly what the formula is. And so the probability is defined implicitly over samples instead of explicitly over, uh, over parameters, instead of defined explicitly using parameters. Um, so this is a generator. Again, it can be any sample, any sampling process. For example, it could be a neural net that takes a Z, it spits out an X. So any mapping between Z and X 
uh, or it could even be something more complicated like some system of differential equations or uh, it could be some simulator, it could be any, any software that generates z from x and that has parameters that we can try to tune. So this is the generator. And then this generator will be trained to minimize a two sample test objective. And this two sample object, this two sample test will come with a learned statistic, which we call the discriminator. Okay, so the discriminator is any function that takes real samples x and it outputs a label for each sample which is going to be zero or one, real or fake. So a discriminator is just any neural net that tries to determine whether the model and the data distributions are the same or not. Um, and we're going to train the discriminator to, to, to separate the fake and the real data as much as possible. So you can see that this is now, um, here, here we're training two models that are trying to uh, achieve opposite goals. So the generator is trying to fool the, discrimin the discriminator and generate data which looks like the true data distribution, which is indistinguishable. And the discriminator tries to, uh, tries to you know, find whether the data and the model distribution are actually the same or not. And so you can think of these two, these two distributions, these two networks, sorry, these two neural networks are playing a game against each other. Uh, a game where one of them tries to fool the other and the other one is trying to not be fooled. So specifically, what I mean by this is that um, both models are going to be optimized using the same training objective except one of them will try to maximize it and the other one will try to minimize it. So this is why it's a, it can be viewed as a two player game in the, in the mathematical sense of the word game where the solution over both models will be a Nash equilibrium of the game. So the training objective for the discriminator is going to be as follows. Here you have it on the, on the slide. So this is simply performing binary classification using the cross entropy objective, which is uh, the objective we would normally use to train logistic regression or a neural net to classify the inputs into one of two possible classes, right? So we're, we're trying to maximize the, we're, we're trying to maximize the log probability of the, uh, I guess, the, we're trying to optimize the log of the score of the discriminator on the data distribution and we're minimizing the log of the score of the data distribution on the fake data. So this objective is encouraging this term to be high on the, on the data distribution and we're gonna to try to make it low on the data coming from the generator. So yeah, again, we're assigning we're trying to assign probability one to points that are coming from the data distribution and probability zero to points that are coming from the model distribution. And with a little bit of math, we can actually work out what is in theory the optimal solution here. So if you take the, well actually I'll, I'll show you uh, more about this on the next slide, but if you were to work out the math, what happens is that the optimal solution to this discriminator, and again, you can get this by you know, taking the derivative and doing some calculus. The optimal solution is this ratio, is this, is this ratio of densities between the data distribution and the model distribution. In particular, this is, you can also rewrite this as the, um, as the, as the sigmoid of the log of the ratios of the two distributions. So the optimal discriminator has the following form. And so it outputs something that's closer to one 
if the data distribution has higher density at a point and it outputs something that's closer to zero if the model density is higher at a point. And in particular, it is implicitly trying to learn the ratio of the densities of the two distributions. So we're not asking the, uh, the general model to have a computable density. Instead, we're gonna estimate its density using the discriminator, okay? So this is an instance of a more general approach, uh, which I guess I'm calling it here, unsupervised learning as supervised learning. So by unsupervised learning, I mean estimating the density of a distribution at a certain point. Uh, I guess, yeah, density estimation, that's a classical unsupervised task. It turns out that we can often perform density estimation using a form of supervised learning. Right, so let's say that our goal here is to is to find a good dis well yes to find a good discriminator. Let's say that we have points coming from two distributions. One of them is indexed by y equals zero. The other one is indexed by y equal one. And for each assignment of y, we have samples x that are drawn from a distribution condition on that sample. So we can rewrite. So this is I guess this is the proof that. Uh, the discriminator is estimating a ratio of distributions. If I wanted to know the probability that y equals one, so the probability that this example is fake or, or real, it doesn't matter, uh, I want to have the probability of one class. This is what the discriminator is trying to learn, right? It's trying to learn the probability that the data is real or the data is fake. It's trying to classify the distribution from which trying to predict the distribution for which the data point x comes. So we can just do a little bit of math here. Uh, we start with the, so we start by applying Bayes' rule in our first equation here. So this is just applying Bayes' rule here. Then we, we apply the law of total probability on the bottom. We expand things. So we, we simplify things a little bit here. And then we just do a bit of algebra here. And then we use the definition of a sigmoid to get the following expression. So the optimal definition for the probability of the, of the distribution coming from a certain class, the optimal form here is, 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 is this ratio. And then what this is saying is by computing this probability using supervised learning, right? So if we can use supervised learning to predict whether the data comes from one distribution or another distribution, we are implicitly learning this ratio between distributions. Uh, and so again, we can estimate the, not exactly the density, but we can estimate the ratio of densities by performing supervised learning. And that's what a discriminator does. It learns this density or this ratio of densities and this ratio happens to be a natural test statistic to use, right? Because like, so this is literally the, the log of the ratio of which distribution is more likely. So this is the test statistic that is being learned by an optimal discriminator, assuming we can create it to be optimal. And, uh, and yeah, this defines a natural two sample test that we can optimize uh, using the generative model. Okay, so that was the training procedure and the, 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 that was the training objective for the discriminator. The generator has the same training objective, except that we're minimizing this objective instead of maximizing it. So the generator is trained to try to fool the discriminator. It's, try, it's trained to try to to try to minimize, to lower the accuracy of the discriminator. This is our goal here. Um, and so we know that for the optimal discriminator, uh, the optimal discriminator is this ratio of distributions, right? So I can understand a little bit better what the generator is optimizing by using that identity and plugging it into my formula 
for the objective for the generator. Okay, so let's say that I have an optimal discriminator, which is this ratio of distributions. I can plug that formula into this objective and, and see what comes out. So this is what happens when I plug it in. I can do a little bit of math here. So I massage things, I divide by two, and then there's just a log four term that comes there. Uh, yeah, I've just added the log and I subtracted the log and I folded the log into the expectation. We get this. And now this equals the sum of two KL divergences. And each KL divergence compares either the data distribution or the model distribution to this weighted average of the data and the and the generator distribution. And the sum of these two KL divergences, that is literally the definition of another type of divergence, which I mentioned to you earlier, which I mentioned to you earlier, which is called the Jensen-Shannon divergence. So if we take the ratio for the ratio that's learned by the optimal discriminator and plug it into our generator objective, we see that our generator objective becomes precisely the jensen shannon divergence between the data distribution and the model distribution. So one way to understand what AGAN is doing is that it optimizes the jensen shannon divergence instead of the KL divergence. But it does that in a, in a strange way. It doesn't optimize it directly like we did with the KL divergence. It optimizes it by the means of samples drawn from both distributions. So here now we have two new properties. We're optimizing our objective using samples instead of a formula for that objective directly. And we also switched from using the KL divergence, we switched to using the Jensen test. Oops. So why would the Jensen-Shannon divergence be a good objective? So first of all, it's still a divergence, so it satisfies all the nice properties that divergences have. It is always greater than or equal to zero for any distribution P and Q. And when P equals Q, actually, actually if and only if P equals Q, the Jensen-Shannon divergence equals zero. So these are the same properties we had for the KL divergence, and it makes the Jensen-Shannon divergence a natural objective to optimize. Uh, it also has a few interesting properties that the, KL, that the KL divergence does not have. For example, it is symmetric. So flipping P and Q gives you the same result. That was not the case for the KL divergence. In fact, the KL divergence behaves very differently if you flip P and Q. Um, and also if we take the square root, then we have a proper distance and a distance is a divergence which satisfies the triangle inequality. So here are some additional interesting properties. Um, and, and we know that if we have the optimal discriminator, of course, again, all of this is contingent on us having an optimal discriminator. If it's not optimal, then we're performing some approximation to this, but this doesn't hold true exactly. Um, but yeah, for the optimal discriminator and the optimal generator, the minimum of this objective is achieved when the objective equals precisely minus log of four. So these are some property of the, of the Jensen-Shannon divergence. The Jensen-Shannon divergence also has some appealing qualitative properties that might make it a good objective to optimize. Remember this figure. This is when we had a data distribution that involves two components, and we're trying to approximate this data distribution with a unimodal Gaussian. And when we try to fit this Gaussian using the KL divergence, the resulting model tries to cover both modes of the distribution. Uh, so it tries, it is mode covering. It tries to cover as much of the input space as possible. On the other hand, if we use the Jensen-Shannon divergence, it tries to fit one mode of the distribution well. So it has this different qualitative behavior. Uh, and we can see why that's the case. Uh, so the KL divergence has the following formula. 
right? So it's the sum over, um, it's the sum over all the data points. And at each data point, we're computing the log of this ratio. If there's some data point that has non-zero probability under the data distribution, it also has to have non-zero probability under the model distribution because we do this division by the density of the, of the model distribution. So this denominator that I just highlighted, it has to be non-zero for any x where p data is non-zero. Otherwise, this will blow up to infinity. So when we train using the KL divergence, we're forcing it to have, we're forcing it to put probability on every point that has non-zero probability under the data distribution. And this is why it is mode seeking, uh, it is mode uh, covering, it has, it tries to cover every point because if not this, if it doesn't, then this objective blows up. On the other hand, the Jensen-Shannon distribution does not have this property. In the, denom the denominator of the Jensen-Shannon distribution has a mixture of the data in the model distribution. Therefore, we're never forced to assign non-zero probability to every point. And as a result, this distribution is mode seeking. So instead of trying to cover both modes, it tries to fit one mode well. And that's something that might be good for us if we're interested in sample quality. In this example, I used Gaussians, I used very simple distributions. But imagine we're trying to model the distribution of all the images. If we were to use the, the KL divergence and our model is not sufficiently expressive, our objective encourages it to try to model every possible image. It, it tries to force it to put some probability under any image that could come from the data distribution. Uh, but it doesn't have enough capacity to fit every image. So it, try, it essentially ends up doing a poor job on every possible uh, image. And in practice, this is one explanation why, uh, that people have used to, to explain why images coming from a model like a VEE might look blurry because it's trying to approximate every image a little bit, uh, but it's not able to, to, to do everything well. In contrast, using the jensen shannon divergence, we are allowed to model only a subset of all the possible images well. And so that could lead to sharper images at the cost of lower diversity in the types of images that we can generate. Okay, so the key idea here is jensen shannon divergence is mode seeking. We're trying to mode, we're trying to model one mode well at the expense of diversity. And that could be favorable for us. Okay, so now I explained to you what's the objective for the generator, what's the objective for the discriminator. Let's put these things together and define the full GAN training algorithm. The way you train a GAN is that you sample a mini batch of training points and you sample a mini batch of noise vectors. And for each noise vector, you pass it into the model to generate a uh, fake sample. And now you update the generator to maximize the training objective. Uh, sorry, no, to minimize the training objective, which means we minimize the accuracy of the discriminator. And at the same time, you try to update the discriminator to maximize the opposite objective. And then you repeat this process. And the hope is that the discriminator converges to something which separates the two classes well but then the generator learns to fool it and we get something that is, uh, that is when, when all of this converged, the, gener the discriminator can't tell the two samples apart and uh, therefore they, they must be effectively the same. Oh, how did people discover it? Was it through mathematical proof? Was it based on mathematical proof or was it by trial and error? I'm pretty sure it's by trial and error. There is, if you read, uh, uh, yeah, there's a story for how the person who invented this, his name is Ian Goodfellow. So this, there's like a story uh, he invented. This, uh, they went for drinks one night and then they started uh, just like throwing ideas. And then uh, they, they, they came up with this uh, idea of having a discriminator that tries to fool a generator. He came back at home, implemented it at night and then it worked. And then they did more research on this. And that's how they proposed the GAN algorithm. And then 
as they were writing the paper, then they later worked out the theory and provided this theoretical justification for what, it, for what it's doing. Uh, but yeah, there's a story you can look up online. Uh, this was like a, a Wired article or something a couple of years ago that, that tells the story, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a visualization of what GAN training is doing. And in practice, GANs are, GANs give really good image quality. That's the main defining feature and the main advantage of using GANs. In practice, they often have very good image quality. In fact, until a year and a half ago, GANs were by far the state of the art uh, in terms of image quality. And in recent years, they have been matched by another model type called diffusion models, which we're gonna see in a few weeks. Um, I would say diffusion models and well-trained GANs have similar image quality, but GANs are more difficult to train. Uh, diffusion models are easier to train, relatively speaking. So GANs can give very high image quality. The problem with GANs is that they're, oh, and this is just an illustration of how GANs have progressed since, they're, since they were invented in 2014. Over the course of four years, they've been improved and refined to, to the degree that they give large photorealistic images, uh, or they, they, they were giving, and they still do, but by 2018, they were giving very realistic images. Uh, and they have also been applied to other domains, so you can apply them even for audio. However, getting GANs to work is challenging. Because the GAN objective is this minimax game between a discriminator and a generator, it suffers from instability during the optimization process. So our objective is no longer a standard machine learning objective, which is our goal is just to drive some objective down. Here we have this game where one part of our model is trying to optimize the objective, the other one is trying to minimize it, and there's all sorts of problems that could arise. It could, it could get stuck in an infinite loop of some sort where it just cycles through different states. Uh, the gradient can vanish. Uh, it can converge to just generating a single example and get stuck in that. And it's also hard to evaluate GANs because we don't have a well-defined objective function of the likelihood. We have um, samples, but samples are hard to compare qualitatively. And so there's a lot of tricks that are needed to train GANs in practice. So just to give you an idea of what could happen, uh, here, this is a picture of, uh, of, uh, of training a GAN. So it starts here, it goes smoothly, smoothly, everything is nice, then boom, it just, the, the gradient explodes and you know, something happened in the neural net, some, you know, maybe the discriminator, so this is, the green is the, gener the generator loss. Uh, maybe the discriminator went into some part of the parameter space that gave the generator a weird training signal, and then the, tra the generator went into some direction with, uh, with like a weird optimization landscape, it got stuck there, and now it has these huge, huge, huge uh, updates, it has these huge gradient magnitudes, and uh, yeah, it's just stuck there, and, and, and you don't really know why. So th these things happen all the time, and getting again to give you the kinds of images that you saw in the previous slides is actually very, very hard. Um, so another example is something called mode collapse. So this is a set of samples drawn from a standard type of GAN. You can see that these samples are pretty much the same. Uh, so it's easy for it to get stuck in generating one example very well, but not covering any of the other, not, not generating anything else. Uh, this is an instance, it's called the mode collapse problem, and it's tied to that property of the gen Jensen Shannon divergence, where we generate only one sample, where we can, we, can, we can get away with generating one part of the data distribution well, but not generating anything else. Um, and then, so this is an example, this is a, a toy example where we can isolate the mode collapse problem. Here we're training on a distribution that's this mixture of 10 Gaussians, and uh, what happens is over time, the generator is generating some mode. The discriminator eventually figures out that this mode is fake and the other modes are real. But so then what the generator does is it just switches to another mode 
and then it gets perfect, and then it perfectly fools the discriminator when it starts to generate from another mode, but then, then this other mode is again, can be detected as fake, so it jumps to another mode, and it just keeps doing this process back and forth, and it never converges. It can get stuck in this local optima of just generating one mode, which every time fools the discriminator, but it's not generating the full distribution. Um, so yeah, this is hard. And this is again another example of mode collapse. Here we train on our favorite MNIST data set and it's just giving, it's spitting out the same digit all the time after it finished training. Um, you know, it's just, it's just another instance of this local optimum problem where it's stuck in generating one image. Yeah, here you can think of each digit as each mode of the Gaussian in the previous example. The same explanation, the same analogy can be applied here. And so in practice, there is a lot of tricks that need to be used. A couple of years ago, there was this famous repo called GAN hacks, which is just a set of practical techniques for training GANs. And that can involve, you know, injecting some noise, playing with the architecture, regularizing things in clever ways. Uh, there's a lot of these techniques that are used to get GANs working in practice. Um, but then the question is also, what do we want out of these models? In practice, we could get samples which look bad if we don't tune the, the model well. But you know, sometimes we are not interested in the optimal samples. Sometimes we're, we could just be interested in interesting samples, like this one. So this is an art piece created by Ken several years ago that was sold for $400,000 in, uh, at, a, at an auction at Christie's. And what I'm trying to say here is that the samples that can come from these models are sometimes weird, but there's also potentially artistic value in the weirdness of these samples. Um, so, you know, what, what is a good sample, what is a bad sample? It's something very subjective. And on one hand, it can generate interesting examples. On the other hand, it makes scans hard to work with because it's hard to understand whether a certain sample is good or not and whether our model is achieving something that is acceptable or not. Okay, just to summarize things, GANs generate very good samples. Uh, they're also very broadly applicable. So unlike in normalizing flows, where we have to be very careful about which mapping between Z and X we choose, in a GAN, any differentiable process from which we can sample works here. So that's a great advantage of GANs. Now the downside is that it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't work well for discrete variables because we can't backpropagate through the generator. Uh, and it's also difficult to train because of these optimization processes that I, optimization issues that I described. Um, yeah. Uh, and so in the next lecture, we're going to look at a few more advanced versions of GANs.